introduce Sheikh Awasim al Hakim. He is a Saudi national from Al Khubar. He, he obtained his BA in linguistics from King Abdul Aziz University in Jeddah and later graduated with a high diploma in Islamic studies from Umm Al Qura University in Mecca. Uh, the Sheikh also had a close personal contact for several years with the great scholar Sheikh Salah ibn Uthaymin, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. He is active in delivering Islamic programs for the media in both Arabic and English by participating regularly on both Islamic radio and television programs to spread the authentic teachings of the Qur'an and Sunnah. This includes the popular weekly Q&A session that he holds on Huda TV as well as appearing on Peace TV. Sheikh Hassan is an Imam of a Masjid in Jeddah, a role which he has held for the past 20 years. He delivers the weekly Friday sermons and lectures on various Islamic sciences. Publishing. Jazakallah khair. Yeah, please. Yes. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa man ihtada bi hudah. Amma ba'du. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome to this warm evening. To me it's warm, mashallah, with the heaters and, and the haters and, and, and all the likes. Uh, I did not have close, private relationship with Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen. Yes, I used to contact him every single day over the period of four to five years, but... And uh, now I don't have any affiliation with Huda TV. This information was about 20 years ago. And as a role as an imam, it's not for the past 20 years, it's for the past 37 years, which alhamdulillah I retired last year, or was forced to retire, depending on how you look at it. But now I'm, I'm free as a bird with the grace of Allah, and this is what enabled me to come and speak to you and join you, alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. So I was told to speak for 10 to 15 minutes and then we open the floor for uh, what the people usually would benefit more from, which is Q&A. Um, I selected a hadith, which all of you know, inshallah. The hadith was reported in Musnad Imam Ahmad, Abu Dawood, Sunan Abi Dawood, and al Nasai. Mu'adh ibn Jabal, may Allah be pleased with him, one of the great companions of the Prophet ﷺ says, the Prophet once took my hand and said alayhi salatu wasalam, Ya Mu'adh, wallahi inni la uhibbuk. By Allah, I love you. By Allah, I love you. The Prophet swears twice over such an issue. It has huge significance then he says i said to the prophet in reciprocating by allah i love you as well O prophet of allah alayhi salatu then the prophet said to me o muad do not forget at the end of every prayer to say allahumma a'inni ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik Oh, you all memorize this. You all say it at the end of your salat, whether before tashahud or after tashahud, and we will come to address this if there is time, inshallah, azza wa jal. So this is what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam advised his companions, saying, O Mu'adh, do not forget to say at the end of every prayer, O oh Allah, help me to remember you, give thanks to you, and worship you in the best way. This is a hadith we all know. However, by gathering here and discussing this hadith, we know for certain that the angels has descended and the mercy it, we're being uh, uh, yani surrounded by and Allah and the sakina, the tranquility. And Allah Azza wa mentions us in a congregation better than ours. So definitely it's a win-win for us. Nevertheless, we would like to contemplate upon one single hadith so that we would get closer to Allah, increase our knowledge, and at the same time, understand how ignorant we are. 
Because this is one single hadith and how many thousands and thousands of hadiths we don't pay attention to that we could benefit hugely from. First of all, who is this man that the Prophet وسلم, took his hand, swore twice that he loves him? This man is Mu'adh ibn Jabal. He is from the Ansar, from the Medina. And we know that the Prophet وسلم, used to sell himself every season in Hajj to all the people that come to Mecca so that they would take him in and give him shelter and support him. He goes to all the tribes. Listen, I have this message, I have Tawheed, I have Quran, listen to me. And they all like what they hear and see. But none of them had the cojitos to go ahead for it. And they said, nope, I'd rather be safe rather than sorry. So the people of Medina in Bay'atu Al-Ula, they heard and they liked what they heard. So they went to their people. They told them that, listen, we've heard this from this man and whoa, man, he has something. Next season, Bay'athaniyah, they came with more men. Among them was Mu'adh ibn Jabal. Mu'adh at the time was, how old? 16 years of age. Some say 18 years of age. To us, in our standards, he was a kid. In these days, or in those days, they did not have this description that we tend to have. Nowadays we say that, oh, he's a teenager. He'll grow up. It's okay. Yeah, Sheikh, he is fornicating. He's doing pot. He's uh, uh, watching porn. He's skipping salah. It's just okay. He's, he's a teenager. He's 40 years of age. It's okay. He'll grow up. They didn't have this categorization. The moment you hit puberty, whether it's 15 or 14 years of age or 16, you're a man. And you act like a man. And you behave like a man. So Mu'adh, at that time, was 16 years of age. He was described to be tall, handsome, intellectual, a very, very smart man to the extent that he was among the handful who used to give fatwa at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Now, if you have the Prophet and you had a, an inquiry, you wouldn't go to someone else. You'd go to the Prophet. There were a handful of scholars among the companions that were authorized by the Prophet ﷺ to go and ask and take fatwa. What an honor. Come on, give me a break. The Prophet is there and you coming to me and the Prophet approves of that? What an honor. Not only that, Mu'adh did not miss a single battle with the Prophet MashaAllah, you're all here. How did you come? SMS, flyers, emails. At the time of the Prophet, they did not have this wasalam. Whenever the call for jihad was there, they immediately went with the Prophet. Some of them could have been in his farm, some of them could have been away, which tells you that Mu'adh was always around the Prophet He never missed a single battle. Not only that, look at this highest Purple Heart Medal. What is the highest in medals? I don't know. Look at this medal that he received. The Prophet said alayhi salatu wasalam to the companions, take the Quran from four of my companions. Learn the Quran straight from the mouth of four. That's it? Yes, these are the most knowledgeable among the companions of the Quran. Who are they? Ya Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Ubay ibn Ka'b, Mu'adh ibn Jabal, and Salim, Mawla, Abi Hudayfa, may Allah be pleased with him. And the Prophet والسلام, acknowledged him to be among the scholars. How? He said, Mu'adh ibn Jabal will come on the day of judgment way ahead of the scholars. 
which means that this is a endorsement of the Prophet ﷺ to his knowledge. And this is why he also said in an authentic hadith, the most knowledgeable of my companions about halal and haram is Mu'ad. And we haven't mentioned Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, the Prophet did not, which means that he has something they may have some of, but not all. So Mu'ad was a specimen of his own and he is unfortunately unknown to the most of us. You say Mu'ad ibn Jabal, nice to know you. Who's he? And this is a problem when it comes to our history, to our heritage, we have no knowledge of it. And I always make this joke, may Allah forgive me. If we were to enter Jannah, and then they'll introduce us, this is Salam ibn al -Akwa. Salam ibn al-Aqwa, one of the greatest warriors at the time of the Prophet ﷺ and the best sportsman ever with stamina much bigger and, and stronger than marathon runners. MashaAllah, don't know him, never heard of him. This is Abu Talha and this is uh, uh, so-and-so and this is, I said, guys, <laughs> I don't know any of those. I can't recognize those in Jannah. Uh, can we take a tour to hell? The moment you go to hell, MashaAllah, I know everybody here. <laughs> Homies, what's happening? A'udhu <laughs> Billah. I feel yani, related, I know everyone here. So this is a problem. If you're gonna go to Jannah, you need to know who your neighbors are. So we have to go back to our history books. We have to study the seerah. We have to study the companions of the Prophet, those whom he loved, so that we would have the honor to accompany them, insha'Allah, on the day of judgment. The Prophet وسلم, sent Mu'ad to Yemen as a judge, ruler, teacher, and a mufti. He sent this young boy. He, he was almost in his mid-twenties or less early 20s yet he sent him in this level to a whole country and he was recognized by the great companions Umar may Allah be pleased with him and you know Umar he said whoever wants to learn fiqh must come to Mu'ath go to Mu'ath he doesn't say come to me come to Ali come to Abdullah bin Mas'ud go to Mu'ath he's got the fiqh yes it was trial and error he made mistakes and the Prophet ﷺ corrected him, scorned him and was hard on him. You remember when he once led Isha with his tribe, he used to pray Isha with the Prophet ﷺ, and then he goes to his tribe and leads them in Isha again as a sunnah for him, voluntary prayer, but fought for them. And he used to recite with Al-Baqarah and the people, they used to work from before dawn till sunset, they wanted to go get some sleep. They, one of the companions just said, well, this is too much, <laughs> excuse me. And he continued his Isha for himself and left. So after half an hour when the prayer was over, the good Samaritans went to Mu'ad and said, this man left you and prayed on his own and, and he departed the congregation. Yeah, he's a hypocrite. The same good Samaritans went to him. He said, didn't you hear what Mu'ad said about you? You're a hypocrite. So he went to the Prophet ﷺ and complained. The Prophet ﷺ was outraged. Mu'ad, afatanun ant? Are you causing people to have fitna and you are giving them trials in their religion? Don't prolong the prayer when you lead. When you lead, Behind you there are those who are old, those who have, have errands to attain, those who um, are incapable of standing for, long for a long time. So the Prophet corrected him والسلام, And this is how he learned. When he came back from Yemen, he was sent by the Prophet والسلام. He came back from, the Yemen, from Yemen, what did he do? Anyone? No one, okay. 
he prostrated to the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet said, whoa, what are you doing? Stand up, stand up. What are you doing? He said, oh Prophet of Allah, I went to Yemen and I saw them greet their dignitaries and their rulers like this and you're the most worthy of such greetings. He said, if I were to order someone to prostrate to someone else, I would have ordered a wife to prostrate to her husband. So again, trial and error. All of this is adding to his knowledge. He's compiling this and this is why he's among the greatest of the companions when it comes to knowledge and fiqh. So, what do we learn from this? Uh, I think my time is up. But anyway, yalla, who cares? Tomorrow is Saturday. Instead of going to a nightclub and, and having a good time and partying and getting wasted, Alhamdulillah, we're getting wasted in a halal way. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. So, the first thing we learn that it is permissible to swear. Wallahi. Because Allah says in the Quran, and protect your oaths, that is, do not swear much. But if there is a need, some of us swear on everything. Shaykh, how is the coffee? Wallah is good. <laughs> I believe you, don't, don't swear. Some of us just use Wallah in everything. This is not permissible. Allah says protect your oaths because you're using Allah's name in vain. Yes, when someone says, you didn't come yesterday. I said, I, I did. I said, no, you didn't. Now I have to prove this and emphasize it by saying, Wallahi, I did come yesterday. Khalas, I believe you. So in this hadith, we learn that it is permissible to swear, to emphasize something that is true. By Allah, I love you. He said it twice, not once. Secondly, if you love someone, that is from the same gender, of course, huh? And the, all the brothers are taking their cell phones. Okay, it's Valentine's Day, you know, I'm late, but we, still we can catch up. No, if you love someone of the same gender, a brother loves a brother, a sister loves a sister, in the Islamic sense, not in the LGBTQIXYZ sense, all the alphabets. No, I'm talking about pure love, brotherly love, uh, uh, platonic love, oh, I don't know what you call it, but I love the brother for the sake of Allah. This love is not uh, uh, something that is weird. When we were young, we, you, you don't say, I love the brother. You say, I like the brother. Why? So, no, 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 love is a taboo. If you say, I love the brother, then there's, this was like 40 years ago, 50 years ago, they used to teach this, this when we used to speak in English. Nowadays, we all got out of the closet, alhamdulillah. <laughs> now we have wardrobes, we have cupboards with no closets. It's all banned in our Muslim homes. So it is part of the sunnah to express your love to your brother. The Prophet says, alayhi salatu in an authentic hadith, when you love someone, if you love your brother, you must notify him. And I make Allah my witness. I love you all for the sake of Allah. I don't know you. And this is a general yani, testimony. But I love you because you're Muslims. And you are struggling in a kafir country. And you're striving to observe your Islam, cement your iman, and come to have this bond with your brothers. Why wouldn't I love you? I love you for the sake of Allah and I know you love me back. And if you don't, who cares? <laughs> I don't care. So, if you love someone, reach out. This is not AT&T. If you love someone, reach out and tell them that you love them because this is an Islamic etiquette. The Prophet ﷺ was with his companion and he said, O oh Prophet of Allah, you see that man walking? By Allah, I love him for the sake of Allah. So the Prophet said to him, did you notify him? The man said, no. He said, go ahead and do it. So the man went to him and said to him, I love you for the sake of Allah. And the man said, may Allah loves you for whom his, uh, uh, you loved me for his sake. And this is the Islamic way of sharing your emotions. It's sad when we know one another for 10, 20 years. Hi, ah, what's happening? What's doing? What, how are you doing? That's it. 
and we have this love towards one another, yakhi, show it, express it. It is even sadder when you're married for 30 years to your wife and you fail to say this miserably. Anni ala dhikrik. Oh Allah, help me to remember you. Number one, without Allah helping you, it's out of the question. You're lost. You're a loser. You cannot even take a breath. You cannot inhale without Allah allowing you to do it. This is something. Who's playing with the volume? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so now I have to speak softly. Okay. So you have to always remember that without Allah's help, you cannot do anything. This is why, what is one of the treasures of Jannah? La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. There is no power, no strength except with Allah. It's one of the treasures of Jannah if you say it. There's a palm tree that will be planted for you every time you do this. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. You're queuing. You're in a traffic jam. You're in a problem. Always say la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah and things would inshallah be facilitated for you. And that is what the Prophet used to teach his companions alayhi salatu was salam. Ida sa'alt fas'alillah. When you ask, ask Allah. Wa ida sta'ant fasta'in billah. And when you seek help, seek it from Allah. This is what we say. Iyaka na'bud. Oh, you alone we worship and you alone we ask for help. And this is what the Prophet used to alayhi salatu was salam begin his speeches by. Inna alhamdulillah nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu. We praise him and we seek his help. But we don't contemplate on these words. We just say them. And most of us they rely and depend on the size of their biceps, not on their Allah's helping. When you want to carry something heavy, deadlift, what do you say? Bismillah? Come on, you can do it. I can do it without Allah's help. I didn't do it. Attribute everything you do and every success you go through to Allah Azza wa Jal. Declaring that I have no power, no might, no strength without Allah. And this is when Allah Azza wa Jal supports you beyond your imagination. If Allah Azza wa Jal helps you, you will always be among those who remember Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala in the morning and in the evening. Who amongst us observes the adhkar in the morning? And the evening they usually take between 15 to 30 minutes to accomplish who sits in the congregation saying subhanallah alhamdulillah allahu akbar a number of times la ilaha illallah wahdu la sharika lah a hundred times who says allahumma a'inni ala dhikrika wa shukri wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik allahumma ansak al-afu wa al-afi fi dunya wa al-akhirah allahumma ansak al-afu wa al-afi fi dini dunya wa ahli wa mali who says sayyidu al-istighfar who says a'udhu bi kalimati al-tamat min sharim a long list of adhkar if Allah helps you you can do that you can remember him and when you remember him you can do that before you go to bed everyone goes to bed switch off then switch on, 9 to 5. And in this vicious circle, they go to bed, they forget to say the adhkar at night. I know people that would never ever skip the adhkar of night. And they would recite Surah Al-Mulk, 30 verses. They would recite the whole things they have to say. Because this is your antivirus. Everyone has on his computer antivirus or on his mobile. But you need antivirus so you'll be protected from evil eye, from envy, from black magic, and from jinn possession. I could care less if a sorcerer come now and he says, listen, I have like 20 jinn under my control. So, <laughs> my enchanté in French. I know you guys speak French. So, so, who cares? Aren't you afraid? No, I'm not afraid. I have Allah Azza wa Jal with me. 
I do my adhkar in the morning, in the evening, before I go to bed, after first salah, before I leave my home. I could care less. Do this. Everybody comes in, what's your dalil? And I say, okay, do you know Arabic? I said, no. Do you know the Quran? I said, no. Why are you asking me for dalil? You don't even know the difference between a hadith and an ayah. This is shocking. So, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah at tawbah and if they had, and Allah is talking about the hypocrites, listen, they did not come and participated in the expedition with the Prophet ﷺ in Ghazwa Tabuk, for example. Why? They lagged behind. So Allah is saying, and if they had intended to march out, certainly they would have made some preparation for it. But Allah was averse to their being sent forth, so he made them lag behind. And it was said to them, sit you among those who sit at home. So it was Allah Azza wa Jal that made them lag behind because they did not have the intention. You have the intention to remember Allah, Allah will help you. If you fail, then acknowledge that it was Allah who did not want you to remember him because he does not love you. And this is a scary statement. So we try our level best and Allah Azza wa Jal nagging and bickering all the time. My daughter is dating a non-Muslim and my son is selling uh, uh, cannabis uh, uh, on the streets. I have debts, mortgage, riba. My boss hates my guts. He doesn't give me increment. He doesn't give me a raise. My neighbor always parks in my door. Uh, what, what do you call it? This guy, you know, you know. And Alhamdulillah, everything is fine. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> what kind of gratitude is this? You didn't leave a thing, Akhi. You put everything that Allah is testing you with and complained about and they say, but Alhamdulillah, no, no, this is not the way. Be grateful to what Allah has given you. The cup is half empty and some would say it as half full. It's the same cup. Those who are grateful would say it's half full. Alhamdulillah, Allah gave me half full glass. I can drink it. There are so many people who don't have, the poor sheikh doesn't have a mug. He doesn't have a thing. Allah gave me half full mug. How much blessing would Allah give me? Those who are ungrateful, pessimistic would say, why half empty? So many people have Starbucks in their homes, not coffee mugs. They have so much coffee, they have six or seven mugs. Allah has given them everything. Allah gave me only half empty. Ah, this is how you look at things. And this is what defines you. When you're always content, grateful, thankful to whatever happens. When someone bangs your car, what do you do? Road rage. Are you crazy? You come out shouting, you want to fight, you get your baseball bat. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> what is this? Okay, I'm getting my hockey. But what do you call this hockey stick? I don't know. Anyhow, running behind this small thing. Yeah, he buy each one of them one and khalas, stop fighting. Hockey pot. Anyhow, so why are you doing this? Yeah, sheikh, he banged my car. He did this. It's insured. Alhamdulillah, nobody died. Alhamdulillah, you did not get any injury. Your children did not go through with a windshield. Be grateful. Alhamdulillah. So the believers come out of the car with a smile on their face, content and saying, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. It could have been worse. Those who are not grateful, they would do a lot of bad things and whine and, and complain. So be grateful to Allah Azza wa And finally, أَعِنِّي عَلَى ذِكْرِكَ وَشُكْرِكَ وَحُسْنِ عِبَادَتِكَ Husni عِبَادَتِكَ means and worship you in the best way. He could have said, and to worship you, help me to thank, uh, to, to uh, worship, to remember you, to thank you and to worship you. No, do adhkar, that was not reported. They celebrate events, the uh, um, Shabi Barat, uh, in the, the 27th of Rajab, the 15th of Sha'ban, we're coming. They celebrated, okay, that's good. I like 
your enthusiasm, but before you do it, did the Prophet ever, alayhi salam, had, uh, had done such a thing? Did he ever do such a thing? Yes or no? If yes, I would humbly request an authentic hadith. Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawood, Tirmidhi, Nisa, Ibn Majal, Hakim, Mustad, any, anything. Give me a hadith. If you fail to do this, then this is a what? An innovation. Stay away from it. So this is why the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, and worship you in the best of way. Now, I think we've spent so much time. There, is, there are so many things in this particular hadith that we could benefit from, but the time is not gonna help us. I conclude. When to say this dua, the scholars differed. Some say before salam. After you do the tahiyyat, tashahud, then as salat ala nabi alayhi salam, salat al ibrahimiyyah the salutation or the durud, as in, in Urdu. Then you say, in conclusion, before you offer salam, you say, Allahumma anni ala dhikrika wa shukri, uh, uh, shukrika wa husni ibadatik, and you offer salam. And this is the most authentic opinion according to Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah, ibn al Qayyim, ibn Baz, ibn Uthameen, and the likes. Why? Because they say in salat, before salam, it's the time for dua. After salam, it's the time for dhikr. Unfortunately, the vast majority of Muslims after salam, they raise their hands, dua, then they wipe themselves and shower themselves and, and do the whole nine yards. What are you guys doing? Said, oh, baraka, baraka, blessing. Okay, again, let's go back five minutes. Do you have evidence from the Prophet ﷺ he used to do this? If yes, I'm going to share it with you. I'm going to do it from today. If not, you're innovating. So they come to you and say, yes, we have evidence. Okay, Allah is equal khair. Mawlana, come please, share it with me. He said, the Prophet ﷺ, before going to bed, he used to cup his hands and recite the last three quls and wipe over his body. Okay, so this is your evidence. Duh. This is before going to bed. You're in Fajr, you're in Dhuhr, you're in Isha. Where is this? He said, yeah, but he used to wipe himself before going to bed. Yeah, he before going to bed. He didn't do this during the five daily prayers. Never ever once it was reported. He, could it be he lived in Medina for how many years? 13, 20, 10. Uh, <laughs> where is Ronaldo Cristi, Crist, Crist, what's his name? Cristiano, I think. Where does he play? Nasr, mashallah, Saudi Arabia. Come on, guys, this is your prophet. And you don't know how many years he lived in Mecca and how many years he lived in Medina? Which year did he die in? Long time ago, Sheikh. Right, mashallah, you know your history. Give me a year. Huh, 10. Mm, close, but no cigars. Hmm. 11. On the 11th year, the Prophet lived 13 years in Mecca, 10 years in Medina, and he died in Rabi'ah al awwal on the 12th of Rabi'ah al awwal which people now celebrate. That's mind blowing. All scholars agree that he died on the 12th of Rabi'ah al awwal they differed if he was born on the 9th or on the 12th. So those who celebrate the Mawlid, they're actually celebrating his death. Isn't this mind blowing? And it's an innovation, but this is not our topic. Khalas, come on, Sheikh, you've stretched it too much. Another word, we're gonna beat the heck out of you. Okay, I respect myself. So it's best to give the dua before the salam. Because the Prophet told us this, alayhi salatu wasalam. After you conclude the salutation, ask whatever you want. Then conclude your prayer. But he never said to do the same after the salam. You have dua. Why do you raise your hands after salat and make dua? Uh, because I want Allah to answer me. Okay, the Prophet told you, you want Allah to answer you? 
make dua in sujood. The closest you are to Allah when you're in sujood. This is a prophet's hadith. The closest one of you is to Allah when he's in sujood. So choose whatever dua you like. This is what the prophet said. This is what he's recommending you to do. He said, no, 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 I'm not going to do it in sujood. I'm not going to do it before salam as he requested. I'm going to do it after salam. Suit yourself. <laughs> That's your problem, not mine. Therefore, I conclude with this is one single hadith that we all know of. And I myself have benefited a lot from this discussion with you. And I hope that you've also benefited from the points that we've mentioned and studied together. Imagine how many things we don't know about the tens of thousands of other hadiths that we know, but we've never contemplated upon nor studied. Hada wallahu a'lam wa nisbatul ilmi alayhi aslam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyyina Muhammad.